Today, you should focus all your attention on being good at finding good deals. There's thousands of investors and they all want good deals. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. Hello and welcome to episode 50. In today's tight and competitive real estate market, how do you find those hidden gems? And can you still profit from foreclosures? Well, my guest today is national real estate expert, Tony Youngs, and he's gonna share with us his 30 years of experience, systems, and strategies in acquiring foreclosures and hidden market properties. Now, this is great because Tony is also gonna be speaking at Michigan's largest free real estate investor and landlord conference and expo right here in Grand Rapids, Michigan on February 24th, 2017. And you can get your free registration if you go to rpoaonline.org. That's rpoaonline.org so that you can register for free to hear Tony and six other national speakers who will be speaking that Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Tony, I'm looking forward to hearing you speak at the conference. And I want to thank you for doing the podcast today. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Brian. Now, you have well over 30 years of experience in real estate investing. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how it all began? Okay, Brian. Well, first of all, after I got out of high school, I went to work at Lockheed. Uh, it's, a, it's a company that builds airplanes. And uh, I went straight to work for them. And uh, I was, that was my career was to be an aircraft mechanic. And after about 10 years of being an aircraft mechanic, I, all the other people that I worked around, <laughs> these older, older mechanics, they were always talking about investments. They were always investing their money in something, but I didn't invest in anything. I didn't know anything about it, so I couldn't even fit into their conversations. So... One day I was watching TV and I heard a guy talking about real estate and uh, how you can make more money than you could at your regular job. And they were promoting a free two-day seminar back in November of 1986. So I decided I was going to go to that because I liked what I was hearing about real estate. So so I went to the seminar and I learned all these things about money that I had never experienced before. And I decided that uh, I was going to invest in the system and give it a try. Do you remember and, who the speaker was and what the system was? Yes, uh, there was it was a conference with about 10 speakers. But the one that was promoting it was a guy named Dave Del Dotto. And uh he, he was a guy from Hawaii that uh, was, you know, just a normal, you know, guy. He was like Carlton Sheets. Uh, Carlton Sheets was on TV all the time at the, at the same time Del Dotto was. Oh, yeah. I remember Carlton Sheets. But I went to this Del Dotto seminar, and there was over a thousand people in the room that weekend. And... Uh, so I just liked what I heard, so I decided to invest uh, $497 in the, the home study system. And, of course, when I got home, all my friends and family and brothers and sisters, they were, they were saying, you idiot, that stuff doesn't work. And, uh, you know, you just wasted your money. So they were laughing at me, and, but I believed it would work. For some reason, I just felt that this was going to work for me. So what I did is I applied the system. I went out and gave it a try. And uh, so I stumped, you know, I got a list of foreclosures and I was uh, going out and looking at those foreclosures on my way home from work every day. I would get the legal notices with the addresses of people that were in foreclosure. Their homes were scheduled to be auctioned off at the courthouse steps in a couple of weeks. 
So I would drive through neighborhoods and look at these particular properties. But I didn't do anything else because I had not studied the entire system, so I didn't really know what to do next. But I was so amazed that they, these properties were there. You know, you get the paper, you go to the house, and it's there. Uh, but then what happened is a couple of weeks later, I ran across my first vacant house with the grass was three feet high, the, the gutters were falling off the roof, the paint was peeling, and it looked like a haunted house that no one had lived in for several years. So that was the first time I actually pulled in the driveway and I got out of the car so I could walk around the house and just sort of look at the, you know, look at it up close. And when I was looking in the windows, somebody was in there. They were actually looking back at me, wondering what I was doing in their backyard. So I went to the door to say, listen, I am so sorry. I thought this house was vacant. I said, I saw that it was going up for auction. And uh, so when I stopped by, I thought it was a vacant home. And I'm very sorry that I was snooping around. And they said, well, if you'd like to buy the house, come on in. I'll show you around and just tell me what you could give me for the house. So I walked through the house. Uh, I saw it needed a lot of work. There were no lights uh, because the power had been shut off. The house smelled because they had pets. And uh, these people were about to lose their home. So they asked me how much I would give them for it. And I didn't have any money, so I made a real low offer, hoping to be turned down. And they did turn me down when I first told them how much I would, would give them. But what happened is before I even backed out of the driveway, they came running down the driveway and they said, listen, we'll take your offer. So then I had to study those books and tapes to figure out how to buy this house. I had no idea how to do it. The name of the book was How to Buy Foreclosures with No Money or Credit. And that was a big thing they were teaching way back then. So I'm trying to find how do you do this with no, no money. And it talked about different techniques. And I used one of those techniques and I got the deal. And when I, I, I didn't have much money to fix it up, but I did elbow grease. I, you know, I bought some paint and I painted everything. I shampooed the carpet a couple of times. I scrubbed the appliances and the cabinets and the countertops and the floors. <coughs> and then <clears throat> what happened? I, after I fixed it up, I refinanced the property for the after repaired value. And I was able to pull out uh, a check that was equal to a year's wages at my regular job at Lockheed. And that was my first deal. Wow, that's a great start right there. After that, you know, I, I took that money and I reinvested it in a second deal. And then I did a third deal, fourth deal, and I did pretty good that first year. So after my fifth deal, I quit my job at Lockheed and became a full-time investor. I'd say that's a great result from your $497 investment in the package. Absolutely, it was. Uh, I've never looked back. It's just been a fantastic lifestyle. Uh, we all want to work for ourselves. And you know, it's just great being able to punch my own clock. So how has that strategy that you started uh, so long ago, how has that evolved over the years? I mean, well, what happens is after you go through your first deal, you know what to do because you learn from the first deal. So you're better on the second deal because anything that appeared to be some sort of a mistake, you... Uh, you you know what to look for on the next house. Uh, you know, for instance, if you find a house that, you know, had a foundation problem, you'll know to look better at the next house on the foundation. And that's how it just evolves itself. It, uh, 
you just get better and better with everything. Uh, you use the example of the foundation. Can you talk about some of the other mistakes that you made early on? Well, one time I bought a house where the whole backyard was about three feet high and uh, in grass. And so I just thought, well, you know, after I buy the house or after I make an offer, I'll just take a weed eater and cut all that down. So after I ended up buying the house and I got back there to weed eat the backyard, it was covered in hundreds of thousands of branches. The Down inside all that grass was tons of, of branches and tree, uh, you know, fallen trees and all this stuff. So it wasn't easy to just weed eat. Uh, so I had to actually get a bulldozer to come in and scrape and push all those branches into a corner. And then I had him dig a hole and bury most of them. But uh, so that taught me that if ever I buy a house with high grass to actually walk through the grass and hope I don't get bit by a snake. But, uh, you know, just see what's underneath all that grass. And your strategy of, of buying foreclosure properties, what's your strategy after that? Are you a buy and hold investor or are you flipping these properties? Well, today I'm flipping. It all started with the crisis, uh, you know, changed my way of doing things. But in the, the first 10 or 12 years of my career, it was mainly buy and hold, um, you know, and fix up because I was really good at fixing up properties. And I was good at managing properties myself because I knew how to fix things. And I still do today. I still uh, have rentals that uh, if something goes wrong or a tenant calls, I go evaluate it myself and see if I can fix it myself. Uh, but today I'm more of a wholesaler. There's hundreds of investors that will buy anything you find. So I'm mainly a guy that's really good at finding good deals and I find them for other investors and I just wholesale them over to them. Uh, I've, I've rehabbed a lot of houses in my career, but uh, today, you know, time is more valuable than money to me. And uh, so I don't want to spend too much time, but I, the last house I did rehab and sell was in 2014. I actually rehabbed the entire house by myself. And it took about four to four or five months. And I could have found several deals during that time, but I spent all my time on this one. But it was a nice, pretty paycheck. Uh, it was uh, so it was. It was kind of worth it, but as I look back, I say, heck, I should have just wholesaled that and just kept doing what I do. Because you see, Brian, today you should focus all your attention on being good at finding good deals. There is thousands of people with money and there's thousands of investors and they all want good deals. So the person who focuses on being the one that finds the good deals, everybody wants to partner with you or everybody wants to buy those deals from you or they will give you the money up front to go out and find deals for them. So it's a uh, it's just, uh, you know, finding the good deal is, is the best way to go, in my opinion. When you speak at the conference in February, your topic is hidden market strategies in today's current market. So I imagine that part of that is about finding the good deals. Can you talk about that and also describe what you consider to be the hidden market? What, what does that mean, the, the hidden market? Okay, a hidden market are homes that you can buy that have no for sale signs. These are de these are distressed houses that are all over the nation, even in Grand Rapids, that are distressed and some people actually live in them and some are vacant. But there is no for sale sign, there's no ad in the paper, nobody even knows these homes can be bought. 
As a matter of fact, a lot of the houses I buy, the owner did not even know his house was for sale that day. And that is the hidden market. You see, everybody else, they go on the Internet, they go on Craigslist, they go to the MLS, and they they want people to, to, you know, they go on those things looking for good deals. But because everybody else knows about them, it turns into a bidding war in some cases. But the houses I find are homes that are not for sale. They're, they're, I just knock on the door if it's occupied and I say, listen, I'm looking to buy a home in this area. Would you be interested in selling your home? And it turns out that some of these the people do want to sell, but because they may have gotten laid off, they may have lost their job, they may have a death in the family, they may have, uh, uh, they may be going through a divorce and they're not sure what to do. But the bottom line is they all think that you have to fix it up before you can put it up for sale. They think, who would want to buy my house? until after I clean it up. Because, you know, the majority of people, if their house is distressed and and you go inside, there's usually years of stuff all over the house. Some houses I've been in, you can hardly even walk through because there's so much stuff. People are like hoarders. So naturally, even if they need to sell their house, they're not ready yet because they they think they have to clean all that up so they can show the property to prospective buyers. So when I approach people and say, listen, I'll buy your house in as is condition and you don't have to do anything to it. They're totally amazed that I would buy that house in that condition. And a lot of times I say, you just take what you need or want and the rest of it, I'll take care of it. I'll, I'll get dumpsters. I'll take them to take stuff to Goodwill. I'll take things to the recycling places. You just take what you need. Do you have any uh, examples of houses that you've bought in, in terrible condition and like just some, some horror stories that you'd like to share? You know, everything can be fixed. I mean, I guess it's the difference in the fact that if you know a little bit about rehabbing, and someone who doesn't know anything. But, you know, even someone who doesn't know anything, they find out there are certain things wrong. You know, we watch those TV shows of fix and flips and, you know, flip this house and all that. And, you know, those shows are, are made to create drama. So if you watch them shows, these guys, these big money guys, they, they, get a house, and then they go through the house and they discover things wrong. And uh, so they go, oh, my God, this this is much worse than I thought. Or somebody finds something and says, you know, it's going to cost you $10,000 more to fix this item. But they always come through with, you know, as a winner in the end. So that happens sometimes when you you know, tear out a wall and you find mold behind the wall. So, you you know, you're going to have to pay an extra three or four thousand for mold remediation. Those are the kinds of things that may happen. But you just when you make an offer, you try to create a fudge factor just in case. And then if you discover that nothing else is wrong, then you actually make more profit. But uh, you just got to you got to know how to create that fudge factor for those what ifs. But I'll tell you one thing, Brian, there is nothing that I've ever seen in my entire career that could not be fixed. I bet in 30 years, you've seen quite a bit, huh? Yes, uh, I've seen it where, you know, the whole foundation was, I've seen cracked foundations where the floor joists are, uh, are so out of whack that the floors are so uneven, but it's just a matter of pulling up the plywood in those areas and 
you know, rebuilding that particular portion of the floor and fixing the crack, you know, uh, in the foundation. It's, you know, if you go to Dallas, Texas, every house has major cracks in the walls and the foundations and the people still buy and sell and live in those houses. And I've never seen such cracks in my life. Some of these you can stick your fingers in there. That's, you know, because they're almost an inch wide. And uh, But they say, well, that's the way the earth is here in Texas. It's always moving. So, uh, you know, we just, we just adapt to it. And uh, so... I'm just glad that I don't live there, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but you know, they're no, it's normal for them. You were saying when you did your first deal, you were able to refinance and pull out more money than, than you were making in a year at your job at Lockheed. Can you talk about the economics and, and the profits that you've seen for a typical foreclosure investment that would be typical for you or your students? Okay. Well, if you, I, I break it down into three options. Option one is where you wholesale the property. You find a deal that looks horrible, it's ugly, it needs a lot of work, the grass is high. If you find the owner and get that house under contract, you can wholesale that house to another investor without even touching a nail or a hammer. You don't even have to touch a lawnmower. There are people that will buy that from you uh, at a just a slight cost more, say maybe three or four thousand dollars more than you paid for it. Option two is where you do buy a house. You cut the grass. You go inside and throw away all the junk. You sweep it broom clean and you leave the rest of the rehab for another investor. So therefore you can get a higher price because you actually did a little work on it. You, you cleaned it up, but you left the majority of work for the next investor. Option two is good because you're selling it to a cash buyer. Option three is where you go ahead and fix everything. You, you fix it up yourself, you make it look brand new, and then you put it on the MLS and, and you get multiple offers in most states. So therefore you would, uh, that's where you could make, oh, 30,000 plus in just on average. It depends whether you're on the West Coast or the East Coast. Uh, it depends on the, the pricing of the housing. But here on the East Coast, the majority of houses run between 150000 to 250000 That is the median price of the market. So it's not uncommon to make thirty to $35,000 profit on a house. Uh, so... In on, you know, like, say, California, Seattle, uh, Washington, uh, places like that, the homes are much more expensive. The median price for a home is about 450 to 550. Uh, that's on the lower end. So therefore, you can generate uh, probably 80 to 100 thousand dollars profit. Uh, and so it just depends where you're at. But I'm telling you, if you can make a uh, 25 to 35 thousand on a house flip, that is good money. And it usually takes you about four months to do that. Now, you're going to be speaking in Grand Rapids February 24th of 2017 at the DeVos Place. Um, and your, your topic is hidden market strategies in today's current market. Can you give us a little preview of what you're going to be talking about? Well, I'm going to be talking about how you must have a ground game. You know, you're, you're not going to be able to sit at home on the Internet and find great deals, especially on a consistent basis. The ground game I'm talking about is you're going to have to go out in the market and that's where you're going to find deals. So you've heard the term driving for dollars. That's where you're driving through neighborhoods and that's where you find good deals. Now, 
I've tried driving for dollars, and after about an hour, I'm bored. I have no idea where to go next. Uh, you know, I'll go through a neighborhood, and then I'll say, well, which way do I go now? So what I teach people to do is how to plot a course of foreclosure properties, and therefore you have a place to go. You have a your, – your goal is to go see those properties, and because you went out to see those properties, you'll find 20 additional hidden market properties because, first of all, if you're going to do the, you know, the whole course, it's going to keep you out there for four to six hours. And that's how you're going to find all the good deals in that particular area. So therefore, that's what I call the discipline of the system. You see, every weekend I go out and do this. So I, I just know that if you came to me and said, man, I got 50 yard line seats to, you know, the, the football game. Uh, do you want to go? I'll say, no, today is the day that I go out and look at houses. So I'm going to have to pass on the football game. That's what I call discipline. I have to do that because if I say, oh, yeah, yeah. I'll go to the game, then I'm not going to find any deals that week. And I have a lot of investors depending on me to find deals for them. If you remember, I told you during the crisis, that's when I really became a guy who focused on finding deals for other people. Here's why. Because in 2008, the market was declining house values were plummeting. And so I was afraid to buy something. I, I, I really was. And I knew how to do real estate. But I was thinking, well, if I buy something, I have no idea how far down these values are going to go. And of course, I use a formula to make up for that. But in a declining market, even your formula could end up uh, being a disaster if you if you don't know where the bottom is. So during that time, I started going to the foreclosure auctions, and I was seeing people with tons of money, like Wall Street investors, uh, tons of money, and they were buying everything they could get. They just wanted to buy, 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 because their strategy was to buy and hold long term. So during the crisis, I didn't have to take any risk because I knew that everything that I found and made an offer on, I could sell to those guys. So it gave me the confidence to keep moving. And I did very well during the crisis. And now we're doing well because the market has come back. And uh, now it's there are home buyers out there. So if you buy a house, fix it up and hold it. Well, the rental market is really good. Uh, so if you want long term, then, you know, you can find these hidden market deals and, and you get them at a better price than you could off the MLS or a foreclosure auction. So you could hold them long term. And over the next five years, they're definitely going to go up in value. I, I just want to take the time to give you a quick example. Uh, I, I bought a house two years ago and I fixed it up. And an investor approached me saying he was looking to buy rental houses in this particular area. So I had fixed it up turnkey and sold it to him for 139,000. And then he rented the house out for 2 years and he rented it at 1250 a month. So he paid cash for the house. So he was getting 1250 a month rent on time every month. And then he his father died, so he wanted to sell that property. So it had gone up in value and he sold it top dollar, full price for $159,000. So he profited, you know, it went up in value $20,000 during that two years. 
and he collected twelve fifty a month for two years, so that's thirty thousand dollars. And that's a great in, example of the buy and hold strategy, even though he paid full price for a rental two years ago. And that's the that's the beauty of today's market is homes are appreciating in value and there's low inventory in most states, so there's there's high demand. Tony, I'm wondering how do your hidden market strategies differ from other strategies that are involved in purchasing foreclosures? Okay, well, a lot of people will go to the MLS, the multiple listing service, or they'll hire a realtor to bring deals to them. And so you must have proof of funds. So a lot of those people in in seminars, not everybody in the room has proof of funds. So that week, I'm going to be also teaching you, you don't have to have money to do this business. You, there are other ways to, to do this business, but you do have to have the desire and you have to have a, a system of finding good deals. Because if you remember, I said, if you're good at finding good deals, everybody with money wants to partner with you or they want to buy what you find from you. So that's, that's going to differ from a lot of other strategies. So, Tony, if you go to the MLS, you're going to need proof of funds. What about going to auctions? How does your system differ from that? Well, I go to the auctions for every reason but to bid on the property. I go to the auctions to find cash investors because then I can find deals for those investors. You know, a lot of investors that buy at auctions, they, they've done all this research and they're planning to bid on a house and they get out bid. Sometimes this can go on week after week. And so that money is burning a hole in their pocket. So I go to the foreclosure auctions to tell these cash buyers that I have deals that they may be interested in looking at. All right. Well, Tony, thanks so much for talking with us today. Uh, before we wrap it up, any parting thoughts that you want to leave with our listeners? Well, Brian, the uh, I think the hidden market is the wave of the future uh, because it's always going to be very competitive. More and more people want to invest in real estate. And it's just going to be so competitive. And the hidden market is the answer. So I just want to invite people to come on out. I guarantee they'll learn some ideas and some techniques that they would have never known about had they not attended. So it's time well spent. So I just wanted to tell them, come on out and I'll see you there. Fantastic. And the conference, once again, is going to be held February 23rd through 25th of 2017. You're going to be speaking on the 24th, which is a Friday, and it's held here in Grand Rapids, uh, which is in the West Michigan area at the DeVos Place. And it's free, which is, you know, how can you beat that, right? You're going to get all kinds of great information from you and six other national speakers. And uh, I, I don't think you can beat that. I'm really looking forward to it. You can go to rpoaonline.org to register for free. And Tony, I want, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. And I'm really looking forward to hearing you speak on February 24th. All right, Brian. Well, it was my pleasure. And thank you. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review.